Hey, hello and welcome back. It is time for another SSD review. And today we are looking at the XLR8 from PNY. This is the CS3040. Catchy name, I know. But this is quite an odd little SSD. Now, I'll be perfectly honest with you. This wasn't really on my radar until about two or three weeks ago when I've done this whole bevy of SSD reviews recently. And I've been going through loads and loads and loads of PCIe Gen 4 SSDs this one was quite an anomaly. The reason being that when PCIe Gen 4 SSDs were first brought to the market, a lot of brands, one of the biggest hurdles they had was getting the right controller inside to do the job, the CPU, if you will, the brains of the outfit. Now, having the PCIe lane of M2, that PCIe Gen 3 times 4 M2 NVMe lane with a potential 8,000 megabytes per second throughput there, bandwidth available in that pipe there, the question came, not that the SSD brands could just, you know, chuck 8,000 megs down that lane. It was about whether they could have the architecture put together in terms of the NAND, that's the little chips the data lives on, the memory, which helps things moving along, and the brain, that CPU, to all work together and manage to get that channel through there. Now, some of the earliest generation controllers out there for PCIe Gen 3 weren't quite there yet. And one of the ones that was probably the hottest at the time that was very quick to be usurped by themselves was the Fizon E16. Last year, that was a hot, hot, hot controller. Towards the end of the years, though, it then got kind of overshadowed by itself in the Fizon E18. Now, why am I bringing up this whole Wikipedia page of SSD controllers? That's because this SSD today, this little 500 gig SSD here, when we look in the frame of all the other SSDs we've looked at, this one lives kind of in the middle of these. Now, these two here are the Seagate Fire CUDA series, the 530 and the 520. The reason I bring them up is a lot of brands who wanted to get PCIe Gen 4 SSDs out onto the market when PCIe Gen 4 lanes and M2s were becoming a little bit more available on standard PC mo motherboards from Asus, Gigabyte and the like, the result was that they kind of brought out kind of stopgap SSDs. I think that's a bit mean, but I don't know another way to put it. They brought out SSDs that were compatible with these new lanes, but didn't really break things. And then, four to six to eight months later, an enormous range of more powerful and more heavily controller-based um, SSDs arrived on the market. But despite this, SSDs like the PNY here still sell very, very well. And even with their price point not quite being as competitive as some of the ones I've just shown you there, it still has a very interesting place in the market. Indeed, we did testing on this SSD and it worked with the PS Beta as well, with it supporting and arriving with a performance of over 5,600 megabytes per second reported on the internal benchmark, just 100 megabytes higher than the minimum recommended performance there in sequential read that that console allows. Now, when you go for an SSD like this, I think a lot of you out there are gonna be wondering, right, so the XLR8, it's not as fast as them over there, why should I bother? The reason I think you should bother in a lot of these cases is this SSD has hidden charms. It has things about it that are very, very unique. For example, the terabytes written or drive writes per day, let's focus on that more. The drive writes per day on this is 1.0. That means the endurance factor of this is you can fill the 500, the 100 uh, TB and the 2 TB to full capacity and delete them every single day and this SSD will work to full per, uh, performance. Now, a lot of the newer generation SSDs in PCIe Gen 4 have had to compromise that endurance in order to hit those benchmarks as that NAND is getting massively savaged by read, I'm oh, sorry, by write. So we have ones like the WD Black, the, sub, um, the and the Samsung 980 Pro, that have 0.3, so 30% drive write uh, per day ratings there before the drive could be argued to be overused within that five year cycle. Then you've got the Sabrent there and the Aurora stare at the top at 0 0.4. Even the Firecuda 530 arrives at 0 0.7. This is more enduring than all of those. But then again, 
its performance isn't as high, arriving at the 500 gig model we have here with a reported 5,600 megabytes per second sequential read and 2,600 megabytes per second sequential write. One of the slowest sequential write SSDs I've had here for review. And once you scale up to the larger capacities of 1 and 2 TB at 5,600 sequential read, again, that's the cap. But the write raising to 4,300, there's a little more going for it there. And if you are going to use a more modest system and you're not running like a 12 core Xeon or some of these monster two, three, four thousand pound machines, then you're never going to hit those maximum performance benchmarks anyway. And an SSD like this will suddenly become more appealing and that endurance factor as well. It's worth highlighting as well that the PNY, its controller on board, is a Fison, which is great, but it's the older generation Fison at E16. The E16 um, Fison controller there. So again, it's not going to be able to maximize that throughput anywhere near as well as the E18 over there. The SSD um, we've got here in front of you there, and again... Weirdly, this is a double-sided NAND SSD as well. There are NAND chips on either side, despite the fact that it's 500 gig, which really, really surprised me. I kind of, when I think of double-sided or dual-rank PCB SSDs there on the module, I think at least 2 TB. 1 TB I think you can get away with, with quite um, modest NAND inside. I say modest NAND, this SSD arrives with 96 layer 3D TLC NAND. That is NAND uh, of a, a better, you know, uh, endurance quality. That's a lot of the way they get it to work and get it to live that lifespan than a number of PCIe Gen 4 SSDs out right now, which settle on 76 or 64. It's only really the Fire Cuda at 176 layer that has really set the score high, high, high. But even then, because of that heavy activity of the drive, it can't hit the 1.0 drive rights per day that this does. It's even got a 2 million... Um, hours rating on MTBF, and I know we don't really rate MTBF, but it's still noticeably higher than every other SSD next to me here. The price point is a little off-putting. I've kind of alluded to that. The CS3040, the 500 gig model is 130 pounds, and you know you can pick up most of these SSDs next to me for less than that at 500 gig. The 1TB model is 161 pounds, and um, so again the pricing has gone really, really askew there throughout them and again that 500 gig model being at that price is really really peculiar there and the 2TB there at 330 still makes it quite affordable it has to be said and you know price points on a lot of these SSDs are kind of fluctuating all over the place because of things like hardware shortages semiconductor shortages of course uh, effects of the pandemic on production and of course Chia just ravaging SSDs market wide but I think ultimately right now the one way we're going to be able to tell if this SSD can live up to anything is getting it in the test area to put it through its paces with Atto, with Crystal Disk, with AS SSD and maybe a little bit of AJA. Let's make our way over to the test area. Right, so here we are on the desktop of my test PC here. We can have a little look at the PC specifications down here. If we go into my computer, we can find out that we are running a 6-core Intel um, iFi 11th gen processor here. We're also running 16 gig of memory. We've got no graphics cards inside and we are running Windows 10 as uh, the primary drive and that is running on a SATA SSD and we're utilizing a secondary drive for our PNY testing of the XLR8. We've already mounted the drive as well. I should have shown it there. We've already got it there on volume P ready to go for the test we are using obs that will make sense in just a moment and there is a drive at the top the temperature there with the heatsink on board is 36 c that will rise throughout the course of this testing but it is worth highlighting during the course of this that i'm not going to be able to run performance benchmarks while obs is running if i try to run a performance benchmark while obs is running the result will be that it will severely bottleneck that performance look how terrible that is Let's stop that there. We want to use the P drive. But again, it's still not great, and we're hoping to get much better statistics than those. So for now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to disable OBS, and then I'm going to run tests on the following programs. I'm going to be taking advantage of Atto Disk Benchmark. I'm sorry if the screen went black for you there while Windows kind of warned us that um, it needed admin privilege. We're going to run three tests within Atto at different file sizes. 
After Atto, we are going to be running three tests on Crystal Disk Bench, uh, Crystal Disk Mark, and again, that's going to be on three capacities of one, four, and sixteen gigabyte. We're going to be running ASSSD, and ASSSD, we're going to run a, a one gig, a three gig, and a five gig test. And finally, we're going to do some mean time AJA performance benchmarks there with AJA. So. We're going to go through all of those tests, and it's going to probably take me about 10 to 20 minutes to go through all of them with a suitable one-minute cooldown period between each operation. So I'm going to get that done now, and I'm going to come back to you with the results. Okay, so our testing is complete. We've run all of our individual tests one by one. It's taken a little while there to go through them all. But before we go through all of the specifications, I do think it's worth making sure we stay relative. We want to make sure that the speeds that we are getting at, um, can be compared against those of the official manufacturer. So this is the official page here on the left, PNY's own page for this device. And if we scroll on down, this is the 500 gig model here. This is the one we're looking at. And they're saying sequential read speeds should theoretically reach at the very top end, 5,600 megabytes per second. Bear in mind, you will need to have a fairly decent system in order to get those. On top of that, of course, you'll of course have to be utilizing PCIe Gen 4x4 and a heatsink on board. We're also got sequential uh, right there reported at 2,600, which again, for the 500 gig, isn't exactly breathtaking. It is worth highlighting if you go to a larger capacity, like if we look at the 2TB here, then the speeds will change on the higher capacities if we flick on down. So hopefully that will allow us to click on that, but apparently not. But just take my word for it, they do go up much, much higher into the 4s and 5,000s. So now we've got our benchmark there, we can go through each of them. Let's leave that there on the left-hand side of the screen. We'll get rid of that and we'll have a look. So the first test I ran uh, was to go through with um, the Crystal Disk benchmark. I performed three tests. And all three of these tests here will perform with different file sizes. So again, we've got a one gigabyte test file, a four gigabyte test file, and a 16 gigabyte test file. And again, the closest we got was 5,000 megabytes per second here. Now, do, as mentioned, do bear in mind that we are running this system here with a six core i5 processor there. And it is 11th gen with 16 gig of memory, but you will still need quite a beefy machine to hit those speeds. Nonetheless, I was a little underwhelmed by that uh, those performance benchmarks there. I would have hoped to have seen something a little higher there. Um, nice consistent IOPS, it should be mentioned. That's aren't they aren't too shabby. And the sequential write there was largely pretty much exactly what I wanted it to be. I mean, again, sitting at 2,530-odd, it did keep hitting that wall over and over again. So it definitely lives up to that, although the sequential read speed was a little less than I would have liked. Now, moving away... From Crystal Disk Mark, we can make our way into Atto. Now, in Atto, I measured both the IOPS and that of the reported read and write. And again, at a 256 megabyte file, a 1 gigabyte, and a 4 gigabyte file, the IOPS again, fairly normal. You know, just nothing hugely right home about They are within the boundaries of what they suggest on their specifications. If we flick into the read and write parameters there, we can see that the write figures. Again, state there, probably maxing, I think, at around about 2.38 gigabytes, so 2,380. And in terms of read performance, we did see read dip into the 5,000s there. I think the highest was 5,140 there. If we move into the larger scales, we didn't really hit that high. And the largest scale there, 5,240 uh, megabytes per second or 5.24 gigabytes. So again, not too shabby, definitely closer to what they're reporting there so that's good to see if we make our way into the third test this was using ASS benchmark with a one gigabyte a three gigabyte and a five gigabyte there are our IOPS once again and again the IOPS themselves obviously we've gone into the larger files have dipped they do much better on the smaller files there if we move away from the IOPS and just flick into that traditional read write get a little bit more there to go on with it. We see the write was capping out there at 2,300. The read, noticeably less, but again, AS Benchmark is quite a strict tool for this sort of thing. Um, so again, I'm prepared to sort of let that off the tiniest bit there, but not a lot. Um, it's still a little under 
what I would have liked to see on this SSD, if I'm honest. Uh, we have seen it break into the 5000 several times, but nowhere near as much as I would have liked. Uh, and then finally, we ran some AJA testing, which is a little bit inconsistent, it has to be said, due to the DRAM on SSDs getting quite full too quickly. But what I wanted to look at the most is right there at the bottom with the writes and the reads. With the write speed there pretty much consistently falling at that 2000, 2000. 560 maybe 2600 which is exactly what we wanted it to be hitting that throughout that 16 gigabyte massive test file there and in terms of the read the read maxed at 4151 there again less than i would have liked to see indeed that testing was across multiple attempts there and if we move into the one gigabyte from earlier these are the photos that are going to be utilized in the review later we can see that the read there got to a 61468 uh, and even then it that hitting that wall at 2005 2006 right there all the way through and that was consistent even when we went to the four gigabyte test file which had pretty much the same stats there although it has to be said that right wasn't quite as ambitious as it was before but pretty darn close so again performance benchmarks there for the most part pretty good there's a few things there that maybe didn't rock my world as much as i would have liked i think this ssd nowadays might be looking a touch underwhelming i think the price could be a little better particularly given the likes of the wd black the samsung 980 pro fico 20 brent um the auroras for a gigabyte all of these ssds have now been around for quite a few months and in some cases more than half a year and i think the xlr8 may be maybe showing it's near that it's not quite the fastest one out there and now with this newer generation of fires on e18 uh, based SSDs arriving for PCIe 4 on the market. I think this one is in danger of getting left behind. It's still very much on the PlayStation 5 support category. And if the price does come down, maybe look out for it there. But in most other regards, I think there are better SSDs out there. And I, but I will be interested to see what exactly PNY do after this and do they have anything a touch more aggressive in the pipeline. But this has been my review of the PNY XLR8 CS3040. Still a very catchy name. If you have enjoyed this review, do let me know, do let me know in the comments. Click like and it gives me a good understanding of what you guys like to see more on the channel. If you want to learn more, click subscribe. We're always talking about data storage here and SSDs. We've done plenty. There's lots to learn. And do take advantage of the free advice section over on NAS Compares. In the description, there's a link there to the free advice section. Genuinely free. You know, chuck your email in there, whatever going to do anything with it um and any, if you need anything data storage related from nas to dance to thunderbolt to hard drives to ssds to more do let us know it's manned by me and eddie the web guy it's completely free it might take us a day or two to get back to you we do have lives but we do answer every single inquiry thank you so much for watching and i'll see you next time